world feels smaller when we're separated. And that's not good enough. We believe the world is a better place when we exchange what we have. That's why we've been driving global trade for over 160 years. And we continue to do so, even in these uncertain times. Because we're not here for good enough. We're standard chartered, and we're here for good. Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. I, I hope you're all uh, hungry after that little bit of uh, Singapore culture. Uh, I'm going to say a few uh, things up front, uh, then I'm going to hand off to Andy to go through the details of our 2020 results, uh, come back with uh, a, a review of our strategic themes and, uh, and a little bit of the way forward. So all in all, uh, 2020 for us has been a tale of two sides, really. Um, uh, on the one hand, uh, we know that we had, we had a strong start to the year, we had a relatively strong finish to the year in those areas uh, that had begun their recovery. Uh, we know along the way that we, had, uh, the, we absorbed the, the transitory impacts of, of higher credit costs, associated economic slowdown, which, which clearly uh, led to a reduction in, in cross-border trade and investment, uh, and, uh, and led to the, the higher credit provisioning, which was obviously uh, very much focused in the first part of the year. Uh, we also had some structural, uh, th those are all transitory, right? but we also have some structural uh, challenges, though, and in particular, lower interest rates, which we think is going to be with us for some time, and uh, which clearly requires an ongoing uh, recalibration of our, of our business model, uh, which we will be talking about in detail here. Uh, but uh, overall, we demonstrated strong resilience. I think we are, are as convinced as ever that the strategic path that we were on is one that makes sense with a good ongoing uh, market share increases and better penetration and better customer service in our network businesses uh, with a network that is as relevant as ever, in particular around the, the, the broadly defined uh, China trading ecosystem. Uh, our affluent client population continued to grow over the period, so 10% growth in the number of clients. Uh, while we know that the, the, the earnings line itself is volatile uh, with market sentiment, and we clearly had a down downdraft during the, the peak of the COVID time, we're back to uh, full strength in terms of growth in our in our key markets. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about the uh, the mass market and the things that we've been doing there, digitization, data analytics, and otherwise. Uh, and I will uh, go into some detail on our sustainability uh, agenda, both the obligations that we feel that we have, but also the, the tremendous opportunities. In aggregate, we think that, that as we execute this strategy, and uh, we think that there's good evidence that we're on track to execute the strategy, uh, we can continue to grow our income at, at five to seven percent. Uh, we can continue to uh, do that with expenses running uh, below inflation. That we can do that in a disciplined way that, that is is uh, is conservative vis-a-vis -vis our capital position, and then we can get to that ten percent plus return on tangible equity in the medium term. And we put out a seven percent uh, milestone along the way in three years. Uh, which is, uh, as, as far as I understand it, more than you guys think collectively we're going to make, but it's, uh, I think we will see steady progress from the 3% that we produced this year through to 10% uh, in, the, in the medium term, and we'll give you some milestones along the way. But with that, I will, uh, I'll hand over to Andy, and I'll come back with some more comments on the strategy later. Good. Thank you very much, Bill, and thank you all for joining. So just a, a few overview comments, and then I'll move into a little bit more detail on the uh, slides that follow. So as Bill said, it, it, it does feel like a sort of story in two parts. We, we came into the year off a pretty good trend of increasing the row T one and a half percentage points a year. We had a strong first quarter, and then as we all know, COVID came in. And it had two particular consequences for us. One was the impact of interest rates on the top line, and the other was the impact on credit impairments. So if you look at the key numbers here, the operating income at 14.8 billion was down 2%, but that is the offset of some very strong performance, particularly in the financial products area, financial markets area, um, offsetting what were the significant downdrafts on interest. And I'll, I'll talk about both of those in a bit. Um, operating expenses, we said, particularly at the time that COVID uh, was starting to have an impact, that we would tightly control those. We have done that. Those are slightly down year on year. Credit impairment uh, has doubled, but I think the 
testament to the uh, actions we've taken over the last several years to improve the quality of the balance sheet has really borne through. And the good news here is that two thirds of that full year charge actually was in the first half. And the charges we took in the third and fourth quarter uh, were pretty much the same. Again, a bit more detail on those in a moment. Put those together, underlying profit was 2.5 billion, which was down 40%. We took some restructuring charges, some to do with the exit of legacy businesses, some to do with redundancy, and we had the goodwill impairment from earlier in the year. So the roti full year, 3% halved from the previous year, very much impacted by COVID, obviously. The CT1 ratio, however, at 14.4% was the highest we've had it for a good while. And off the back of that, as you'll have seen today, we've announced the recommencement of dividend and the completion of the previous buyback program. So if we move on to slide six, this is showing the walk on the top half between our full year 2019 and full year 2020 income, and on the bottom half, the fourth quarter on fourth quarter comparisons. We have normalized it for currency and stripped out DBA, so there's a like for like comparison. So on the full year, we were down 400 million overall on income, and that on the uh, right-hand side, you can see the interest rate affected products obviously suffered, but on the left-hand side, um, we had a good performance in financial markets wealth management. Um, financial markets, particularly on the rate side, and in the latter part of the year on the credit and capital market side. And wealth management, I think, is interesting. The second quarter on second quarter numbers went heavily backwards, but by the fourth quarter, fourth quarter on fourth quarter, we were about 5% up year on year. So the momentum on wealth management clearly picking up quite nicely. The fourth quarter, which did not get the benefit of the higher interest rates at any point in that, we saw the income come down 11%. If we move on to slide seven, just to give a little bit more insight as to what happened on the interest rate effects. So quite a lot of numbers here. But on the top left, you can see our gross yield over the year actually reduced by 100 basis points year on year. We managed to save about 70 basis points through reduction in the rates we paid. But nonetheless, the average NIM for the year came down to, by 31 basis points, which is uh, about 19% overall for the year. In the middle chart, you can see the progression of that by quarter. And we had indicated that we would see it coming down to roughly where we came out in the fourth quarter, so 124. There's about two basis points of one offs in there. But nonetheless, actually, the NIM has moved as we had predicted. And our view is that as we look forward to uh, 2021, that we would see the full year average being marginally below that fourth quarter level. If we then move on to the other income, so not the directly balance sheet interest related income, this was 2% up year on year and is now 54% of our total income. So particularly important in a low interest rate environment that we are driving this. It was a performance that was helped by the strong first half performance, as you can see from the chart here. And on the right, you can see a descriptor, but the green um, is the net fees and commissions. Those were down 10%, that's primarily um, in the corporate space. But in the blue, the net trading and other income was up 12% year on year or 9% excluding DPA. And that was particularly benefiting from the strong financial markets performance. We move then on to slide nine, just looking at the business by uh, customer segment. The thematic here, unsurprisingly, is that those segments that have a higher proportion of their activity in the financial market space, and to some extent wealth management, did better, and those that did not did less well. So corporate institutional banking, 7.2 billion of income, so pretty much half the group, had a, I think in the circumstance, a very good year, 2% up on income, and at the same time, it controlled costs, which were 3% down. And also the impairment charges, whilst we took impairment charges, 70% of those were in the first half. And actually in the second half, they were much more uh, moderated. Retail banking is about 30% wealth management products, 70% retail products. So it got benefit on the former. 
but largely the rate effect on the latter, and hence why the top line was held back, albeit again, we took costs out uh, almost commensurate with that reduction in the income. And it was a year when we particularly focused upon digitalization and the push, uh, the MOX business and the push on Nexus platform, which we'll refer to later on. Commercial banking has a much lower financial markets mix. It's only about a quarter of its income, and hence the top line there was held back as a consequence of that. And private banking, again, in the period when sort of face-to-face -face contact was more difficult during the early part of the year, that made private banking more difficult. That having been said, our assets under management year on year is actually up by 9%. So on slide 10, this is the same comparison, but now looking at it by geographic region, you can see the biggest top line growth we got was Europe and America's down the bottom. Again, unsurprisingly, um, <clears throat> because it is a corporate business. And the second biggest growth we got was in ASEAN and South Asia, which was up 4%. So whilst Singapore was impacted by rates, we had other countries in the region that did particularly well. Um, India, I think, was a particular standout, 26% increase in income and a fourfold increase um, in operating profit. Um, Indonesia up 16%, etc. So quite um, broad-based um, improvement in several of the markets in that region. Greater China and North Asia, 40% or so of the total group income, 6 billion. Again, the big market Hong Kong held back by rates, but other markets in the region did very well and consistent with the sense that North Asia is pulling through this quicker. Um, we had the Korea business, for instance, grow its top by 9% um, and is now almost approaching $300 million of operating profit, uh, a far cry from where it was a while ago. Um, we, we had strong performance in China as well. So the income in China was up 6% and we're fast heading towards a billion dollars of income from our business in China and hence the investments we continue to make there and into the Greater Bay Area. Africa and Middle East was a more difficult period. So essentially zero on the profit before tax, the income down 8%. The 8% actually belies a lot of currency mixed movements. So if you take currency out and do it on a constant currency basis, we were actually only down 3%. Um, relatively, the Middle East was more difficult with the impacts upon tourism and other things, whereas the African businesses actually were almost stable on a constant currency basis. So on slide 11, we have got the centre and other. Um, put simply, the story here is the vast majority of this is the Treasury activity. And because of the reduction in interest rates, it reduced the yields that we uh, received in the Treasury space. We offset some of that with cost reduction, but net net, there was a three to 500 million drag on the profit, depending upon the segment or the region view. In the segment view, there was also a slight impact on Bohai, where post the IPO, uh, we have a slightly lower stake in that business. And also because of the IPOs, we flagged at the third quarter, we've actually booked 10 months of results in the 2020 year, whereas we will resume the full 12 months in 2021. On slide 12, costs. So costs, we said at the time that COVID came in that we would take a firm grip on those. We referred to opportunities to reduce variable compensation, which we did. We referred to opportunities to reduce travel. Well, opportunities, those happen anyway and travel costs came down obviously a lot. We said we would look at some elements of our investment spend. What actually happened was we decided that we should continue to spend on investments at the same level as we had done in the previous year. That put a little bit more cost into the fourth quarter, but that was a very conscious decision to do that. Uh, Bill will refer to a lot of the things we're doing in this space, but our strong view is that as we build for the period post COVID, it is absolutely vital that we have as many of these initiatives flying as we possibly can do. We have said for 2021 previously, the aim is to keep costs on a constant currency basis um, down below 10 billion. And we said that there will be some restructuring costs about half a billion over a period of time, um, some in 2021 to achieve that, uh, some of that redundancy, and some of that will be about space management and property costs. On slide 13, 
impairments. So I mentioned earlier that the total impairment charge had just about doubled, so 2.3 billion for the year. In the middle chart at the top, you can see the profiling by quarter. So the largest part occurred in the first half of the year, and in the latter two quarters, we've been fairly constant on PL hit. I think the encouraging thing, and not that we're out of the woods yet on this, but is the lead indicators. So on the bottom right chart, the blue line there is the trend on the early alerts, the ones that we keep an eye on, not yet a problem, but could become one. And those, as you can see, are 3 billion lower than where they were at their peak. We have, and I think this is including appendices, we have focused upon the sectors that are most vulnerable, aviation, etc. And the exposures in those actually have come down again by about $3 billion just quarter on quarter. We're tracking countries where people have been able to defer repayments, um, the loan subject to relief. Those have also come down by $3 billion, and we're seeing the vast majority of customers recommencing with their previous payment profile. And investment grade, we put up 20% uh, since 2014. I think the actual numbers there, something like 42% of our book was investment grade in 2014. It's now 62%. And I think that is just really good evidence of the steps we have taken over the last several years, um, having cushioned what could otherwise have been bigger blows in this space. So looking forward, I think the indicators here are of a positive nature, but clearly some way to run yet. Side 14, risk-rated assets and capital. So risk-rated assets overall were up 2% for the year, so just under $5 billion. Obviously, that was helped by the disposal of Pomata, which gave us a $9 billion benefit. If you separate that out, we saw asset quality uh, deterioration, um, increasing the RWAs, uh, an obvious consequence of COVID. But we saw a significant offset to that in asset mix. So quite a lot of the liquidity that we've got is now in our treasury space, ready to be deployed. Um, and that tends to be lower risk weighted. Asset growth was good, and uh, in fact, as you can see for the balance sheet, we had loans and advances increase 5% in the year, so the volume growth is clearly there, and that, we strongly believe, will continue. CT1 ratio of 14.4, that includes 0.2 for the software quick fix, which the PRA are having a look at. Um, but other than that, we had the benefit from the part of sale of about 50 basis points, and then the uh, combined effect of the increase of the risk rated assets and the profit contribution got us to 14.4 with the consequence that the dividend recommences and the buyback recommences. Slide 15, I think, is a really important chart. Um, we had come into the 2020 year in a really good position. The strategy was paying off. You can see that the income was broadly within the range that the expenses were increasing jaws, uh, the roti was progressively improving, and then to the early point, and as we all know, COVID came along. So that has set us back a period of time, but we really do hope that over a period going forwards, as more and more columns get added back here, we'll start to see greens reappearing and look back as being, a look at this period as being a sort of temporary dip in an otherwise longer term strategy delivery. On slide 16, the outlook for 2021. So um, first of all, we are very much of the view that the asset growth is out there and that we will continue to take that, and particularly that that will happen in Asia. However, the facts of the matter are that the interest rate impact rolling fully through the book will reduce the NIM year on year. And when you put the volume and the NIM together, that is likely to be at a constant currency rate, um, a flat-ish year in 2021. But the underlying growth in uh, assets we see very much continuing. We see the expenses, again, constant currency at about 10 billion or just below 10 billion. And we just put here as a sort of indicator, if you take the FX rates um, at the end of December, then those would actually have increased both the income and the cost by about 0.4 billion. So we're usually fairly operating profit neutral on FX, but just to be clear um, that the numbers for next year, if these rates were to continue throughout this year, they would have that sort of consequence. We expect credit impairment pressures to be reducing. Difficult to predict accurately how much, 
that we do see those coming down and then the reaffirmation of the 13 to 14 percent range and the full preparedness to return capital uh, to be within that range. So the last um, couple of slides, slide 17, the overall financial framework. Um, Bill will talk about where we are putting more focus upon, but broadly, this is similar to the framework we've had before. We do believe it is working, albeit with the slight COVID-related delay. We do believe 5 to 7% income after the 2021 year is fully achievable. We are confident we can keep expense growth down below the rate of inflation that we intend to operate, as I said, within the CT1 range. And we're all very clear that to get the ROTI up, we need to work the E in ROTI. And finally, slide 18 then is just the walk from where we were um, in 2020 on the ROTI to get to the 10%. Um, as you would expect, some of this is coming from income, that growth rate there, there's more detail in the appendix, but uh, we think with the underlying growth in the regions and the products that we have now got, that we should be able to achieve that. If expenses grow below inflation, that is below the rate of income, so that gives us leverage there. Impairments, we're assuming that those normalised in the 35, 40 basis point area, as in a bit lower than where they are at the moment. The UK bank levy comes off this year, and as our profits grow, we see our effective tax rate slightly reduce over a period of time. We will keep our WA growth below the rate of asset growth. And then finally, on equity, we are above our target range, getting into the range, and buybacks should give us some assistance also to delivering on that 10% ambition. So with that, let me hand back to Bill. Great. Uh, thanks, Andy. Uh, you, you see the, the little schematic with the, the four pillars of our strategy uh, to the left. Uh, just the, the context against which we are looking at that strategy is, is, is pretty uniformly positive, whether it's uh, GDP growth in Asia, the, the affluent population, both stock and flow growing, the revenue pool in, in the mass market, uh, and the, 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 both the, the challenges around sustainability, the, the challenges in our markets in particular, uh, but also the opportunities. Uh, but the, the, the question that, that we get uh, regularly is, is well, what makes you think you can do this? So you, you've been at this transformation for a while. Uh, why do you think you can grow 5 to 7 percent in the top line and, and with, with the expense and capital profile that Andy just went through? Uh, the, the, the short answer is uh, because that's what we've been doing, uh, certainly up until the point of the pandemic, as, as Andy uh, indicated in the slide a, a couple earlier. Uh, because we've done what we said we were going to do at each stage, uh, we said we would clean up the balance sheet, skepticism at the time, uh, we did that very quickly. Uh, we said that we were going to reinvest and reposition our financial markets business for, for the current environment, and we've done that. I think we saw that very clearly in terms of our performance in 2020 and into 2021. Uh, we said that we were going to pursue an aggressive digitization agenda, and we've done that. We've now got best-in-class applications in the market, whether it's our digital bank in Hong Kong or many of the efforts that we've taken uh, internally. Uh, so these are the, we said we could do this while, uh, while substantially increasing investments, but also keeping expenses uh, relatively flat, precisely flat. Uh, we've done that. Uh, so we have a high degree of confidence that this team can execute uh, against the things that we say that we can do. Uh, unfortunately, we can't control pandemics or the level of interest rates, and that has clearly set us back. We, we, we acknowledge that. And that requires some fine-tuning, which, we'll, uh, which we'll go through as we discuss the strategy. But, but this team remains confident that we can deliver on that medium-term objective that, that we've set. And we think we've got pretty good evidence to support that and an extremely attractive market backdrop. So if we move to page uh, 21, uh, well, I'll take the, the strategy pillars in turn. First is our, is our network strategy. Uh, this, this remains uh, very consistent with what you've seen in the past. Uh, now, clearly, there's been a change. We've, the the uh, zero interest rate or low interest rate environment has taken a, a, a pretty healthy dose out of our cash management business and other deposit-sensitive uh, businesses. Uh, the flip side is market volatility and the, and the quest for yield. I mean, so it's, it's not just the volatility that's void our, uh, our financial markets business. It's also the fact that investors are increasingly shifting to markets that, one, are growing, two, are looking stronger, uh, and three, in many cases, still have some yield. Uh, and we're very well positioned as we grow our credit business uh, to, to pick up that, uh, that yield seeking in, in our markets where we have a, a clear competitive advantage. Uh, the network business is over two thirds of our of our corporate business. It continues to generate very strong returns. Uh, we've got a, a well diversified portfolio of products and services, and, and that means that that through different market environments, as we look over the next three, five, seven years, uh, we would expect there to be secular growth in this business, uh, but also 
uh, rotations from uh, from one part to the other as economic conditions uh, warrant. Along the way, we'll be investing uh, heavily, continue to focus on these low returning client relationships, uh, continuing to focus on building our non-financing income line, particularly important in a in this low rate environment. Uh, and then very importantly, uh, focusing on, on uh, establishing a best in class set of capabilities around our connectivity in terms of digital agenda, vis-a-vis our, our corporate clients alone, or in some cases with, with partners, especially as we build out our uh, supply chain financing business. So if we move on to the uh, the affluent strategy, page uh, page 22, uh, we have a, an excellently positioned affluent client business. Uh, we've invested heavily uh, in both products and customer service over the past five years. We now have uh, best in class designation in, in six of our top markets, six out of seven in, in, to be precise. Uh, that is uh, measured by net promoter score, uh, but also by, uh, by uh, separate surveys uh, that we've done to judge our customer satisfaction with our products and services. Uh, so we know that this is a high returning business for us. We know that it's grown secularly, uh, so independent of, of our efforts uh, over the past 10 years. We know that we've matched market growth, and we think that we can actually continue to match or exceed market growth against a very, very attractive underlying dynamic. Uh, so we will continue to, uh, to focus on this affluent client segment in, uh, in, in everything that we do. We move to, uh, to the next page, uh, page 23. The, uh, you've not heard us talk so much about the mass market business. Uh, you know, the mass market business is, uh, in, uh, for years at Standard Chartered has been a laggard. Uh, we haven't invested in it materially. Uh, we had credit problems. If we, if we went back to the, uh, the early part of the, uh, of the last decade uh, into the middle part of the last decade, we had a series of, of accidents in different markets, which I think undermined our confidence that we could execute a credit-led mass market strategy effectively. Uh, in the meantime, uh, now, what we've done is to invest heavily in two things. First is data analytics uh, to significantly improve the quality of our credit decisioning, but also the, the uh, focused nature of our marketing. And second is to invest in digitization. Uh, so we now have a, uh, an operation that's getting closer to, I will say, normal uh, or industry benchmarks in terms of our end-to-end cost to serve. Uh, where we've got completely digital operations, so for example, our digital banks in, in Africa, uh, or in, uh, in uh, the recently launched Mox Bank in Hong Kong, uh, we've got, uh, we're at the lower end of the cost ratio in terms of the cost of onboarding clients and the cost of ongoing service. So we have more to do in terms of creating a, a truly seamless end-to-end -end flow, uh, but we're now in a position to scale that business, uh, both on the lending side as well as <clears throat> on, the, on, the, uh, on the servicing side, using digital tools, leveraging these data analytics capabilities. We'll do that on our own in the, in the core bank. Uh, we'll do that through partners, as we have with, uh, with our digital banks in, in Hong Kong and in, uh, Indonesia with our Nexus program, uh, banking as a service model uh, in, Hong, in, in Singapore as we roll out the digital bank there. Uh, and uh, so that, that, that combination of, of operating uh, alone uh, with, a, with a, an aggressive digitization and data-driven agenda and in partnership will get us some growth, and that growth will be profitable. Uh, so this will be a, a, a contributor to our 10% ROTE progression in the coming years. We move on to the uh, sustainability agenda. Again, you've heard us talk about sustainability for years. I think we've been a, we've been a thought leader in, uh, in, in sustainability for, for the very simple reason. The markets where we operate will, will be the most impacted, or we are, the most impacted by climate change. So the risk is greatest in our markets, uh, but also the need and the opportunity to transition to a net zero economy is the greatest in our markets. So the impact that we can have by providing transition financing to the, the companies and countries in our footwork, in our footprint, will have a more material impact than, uh, than the, a similar number of dollars spent anywhere else in the world where the sustainability agenda is already more advanced. So uh, there are risks uh, on the sustainability front, i.e. our markets will be more impacted. There's tremendous opportunities, right? $75 trillion of financing required to meet the sustainable development goals over, over the next 10 years. Uh, only 10% of that is funded in our emerging markets, right? That the remainder has to be found. Uh, our very, very strong project finance capabilities and, and sustainable finance in particular put us in an excellent position to, uh, to earn a billion dollars uh, of income and growing. Uh, this will be a, a business line that will grow for some time. But we're matching that with our own internal commitments. Uh, we've been very clear uh, that we will achieve a net zero position for Standard Chartered Bank, including financed emissions, uh, by 2050. Uh, we're very clear uh, that the, uh, the, the requirement to make significant progress against that objective uh, is one that we have undertaken 
uh, significant progress by 2030. The, uh, the actions that we've taken over the past three, four, or five years in terms of, of, of exiting uh, any business financing coal-fired power plants or, uh, or coal production uh, is, it, it, I think, was market-leading, continues to be market-leading. Uh, we've continued to add to that uh, by making clear that, that, our, uh, that our clients will need to have their own transition plans to net zero by 2050, and that they will need to, to demonstrate significant progress by 2030, and we're there to help them do that. So there's both a, uh, a bit of a stick, uh, but much more importantly, there's a carrot, because uh, I think what we're seeing more and more is our clients want to and feel they need to make this transition, and they're leaning on us to provide that help, and we're in an excellent position to do that. So if we can move on to the, the the, the underlying sets of skills and, and capabilities that will be necessary for us to deliver on those four strategic pillars. These are uh, called internally our enablers. First is innovation. Uh, we have a great track record, uh, a recent track record in innovation. It's inside the bank, so we, we have an intrapreneur program where we solicit ideas from our, uh, from our colleagues and, uh, and uh, ask them to effectively compete for support and funding. We've had 2,300 ideas, 2,300 ideas. Uh, we've got an, a, a, a coaching and approval funnel that, uh, that have narrowed that down to dozens now of ventures that have been funded internally, some of which are reaching the point of, of commercialization and real income. But more importantly, it's changing the mindset in the organization around innovation to the point where we, when we look at our, our plans over the next five years or so, we think we can generate five billion, as a half of our income uh, from things or activities or ways of doing business that are fundamentally different. Uh, than what we're doing today. So it's a very exciting prospect for all of us. But that's also manifests itself in a number of, of ventures, uh, which are discrete, uh, starting with, with Mox, our digital bank in, in Hong Kong, uh, which has been, uh, which is market leading in, in, in the Hong Kong market. We now have uh, almost 3% of the population of Hong Kong uh, has signed up for a Mox account. Uh, the vast majority of those have actually funded the account and are using it. Uh, the, the App Store ratings have continued to be at, at, at the top of the, uh, of the tier and amongst the very best in the world. Uh, so what does this say? Santa Carter knows how to build digital applications and, uh, and, and we know how to build digital businesses. Our, our African digital banks are clearly a leader in digital banking across the African continent. Uh, evidence is to us that uh, it's not all about getting the latest and sexiest technology, but, but rather having something that's appropriate for the market and delivered in a timely way. Uh, but it, it goes on from there. Uh, we've, we've now uh, announced the, the launch of our Nexus platform in Indonesia. This is, the, the, I think, the, the first truly scaled banking as a service model coming out of a large bank, uh, where we will be delivering a full range of banking products to, uh, to our Indonesian or to Indonesian customers via e-commerce platforms. First partner is Bukalapak with, uh, with 100 million customers in Indonesia. Very, very exciting proposition. As that, we're advanced testing now. As that rolls out, we'll, we'll look at how we can roll that out to other markets. But it goes on and on. Uh, we, we are a leader in, in, in digital assets. We've announced the, the launch of Zodia, which is a digital asset custodian, doing this together with, uh, with Northern Trust. And Northern Trust has come in to take a, to take a small stake on the back of something that we built at Santa Charter. Uh, the, the, the opportunities to, to capitalize on the market at its infancy, and I, I would say that in terms of institutional interest in digital assets, the market is at its infancy. Uh, the opportunity to take a leading position there is very exciting for all of us at Santa Charter. Uh, the list goes on. If we move to page 26, the, uh, this can only be driven by uh, the, the, the uh, people and by the ways that we work. So we've had a fundamental program, and he's referred to it regularly, uh, around our new ways of working. Uh, this is a, a fundamentally client-focused, end-to-end approach. Uh, without the productivity gains that we have already generated through our new ways of working, but more importantly, will generate in the, in the years to come, we can't maintain the high investment pace that we have been undertaking, while at the same time keeping expenses well below our income growth. Uh, so this new way of working, uh, again, something that I think is, is familiar across the industry at Standard Chartered, we're, we're actually doing it, and it's making a difference, and it is what's allowing us to achieve the, uh, to, to, to make the strides that we have. Uh, finally, if we move to the, uh, to the next of our, of our key enablers is people. Uh, the, uh, we focus very heavily on developing our people. We've changed our incentive mechanisms uh, to incentivize the kind of behavior that we talked about today, whether that's uh, innovation or new ways of working, agile leadership skills, uh, in addition to coping with, with, the, uh, with the sorts of things that we had to deal with in 2020 in terms of flexible working and the like. Uh, the the, the result of, of a lot of that reskilling has been a, a much better qualified workforce for what we're trying to do. Obviously prepared to, to hire externally to fill those gaps, and we, we continue to be an attractive 
uh, hirer. So you know, people want to work for Standard Chartered uh, very, very importantly. Uh, but it's also meant that, that uh, as we inevitably have roles that go away, as we automate, uh, we've been able to reposition uh, those colleagues as a result of being reskilled inside the organization. So uh, I think as, as we look at the, the ongoing automation, we should be able to place somewhere between 25 and 50% of our colleagues internally. Obviously, uh, from a financial perspective, avoiding some of the restructuring costs, but, but more importantly, offering career options to, to colleagues, which, which becomes a big draw for people into, into Standard Chartered Bank. So if I could just uh, wrap up uh, quickly on page 28. Uh, we are uh, fundamentally a purpose-led organization. I think everybody will say that, especially since uh, yeah, some large investors said they have been calling for every organization to be purpose-led. We've been purpose-led for some time. Uh, our, our purpose of driving commerce and prosperity through our unique diversity uh, very much informs uh, our strategy. It informs the way that we focus on our business. It has, uh, for uh, certainly for my time at Center Chartered, and it will, no doubt, for years to come. What we talked about, though, is, is how we can take this, this purpose and go beyond the, the one-year budget or the three- or five-year uh, corporate plan or strategy, strategic plan and turn that into a set of aspirations uh, that can, can take us outside of our comfort zone fundamentally and get us to, to the position where we can make material contributions to the societies in which we operate, uh, which will in turn uh, improve our financial performance structurally and over the long term. And, and you'll hear more and more from us about the, the, the three broad buckets of aspirations uh, that, we, uh, that we are setting out. First is, uh, is, is in and around uh, the agenda to reset globalization. Right? Globalization, dirty word, uh, everybody hates it because, uh, because it, it had terrible economic and political consequences uh, over the past several years, uh, all of which is, is correct. Uh, but globalization has also uh, lifted billions of people out of poverty and can continue to, and in fact is continuing to, in many of our markets. But it needs to be reset to be fair and equitable across all the stakeholders in the global economy. And Standard Chartered is in a very strong position to our global network, uh, to uh, both on our wholesale and retail side, to deliver a, a, a set of products and services and ideas uh, that can help the world to reset globalization, get the benefits uh, while addressing some of the underlying challenges. Second is, is lifting participation in the financial economy. Uh, we recognize that, that the bulk of growth in many of our markets comes from small businesses, but small businesses are structurally underbanked in many of our in many of our markets. The opportunity for us to step up with our uh, very sophisticated corporate lending approach, as well as our uh, very well-established retail position on the ground, should allow us to finance small businesses to a far greater degree. We will have a particular focus on lifting the participation of women uh, in the in the financial economy. Why? One, they're underrepresented today. They're underbanked today. In many markets, they are the economic driver uh, and the most untapped resource that's available to us. So, so we will focus more and more on how we can get to hundreds of millions of people uh, with a disproportionate share of women. And third and finally is, is sustainability. Uh, sustainability is, uh, I've talked about already, both in terms of the, the, the obligations we have, but also the, the opportunities that we have. And we will be coming back with, with, a, with a series of aspirational goals for how we can transform uh, our global climate agenda uh, into 2050, and, and uh, but obviously with, with very important progress along the way. So can we do this at Santa Charter? Can we get to this 10% plus return on tangible equity? And we have absolutely no doubt that we can. Uh, a little bit faster if we get the, that, that bump in interest rates that seems elusive right now. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we were on track. Uh, the strategy is delivering. The, the performance in, in 2020 and into the early part of 2021 uh, supports that confidence. Uh, and with that, I would like to hand it back to the moderator to take some questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question via audio, please press star and one on your telephone keypad and wait for your name to be announced. To cancel your request, please press the hash key. Alternatively, please use the question box available on your webcast page to submit your questions. Your first question comes from the line from Ronit Goes from Citigroup. Your line is open. Great, thank you. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, Bill and Andy. A couple of questions, please. One on um, the financial market performance in Q1 that you call out, and a second one on capital return, please. So on, on financial markets, um, you've called out a good start of the year. Could you just give us a bit more color, please, in terms of, you know, is this... Um, which parts of Asia is this being driven by? Is this mainly FX or is it also rates, um, steepening of the yield curve helping? Any sort of color on that would be awesome. 
Uh, the second question is on capital return. Um, so the sort of buyback um, dividend split for uh, that you've just announced is almost 50-50, and I understand why, because of you know, last year's buyback being completed. Is that any kind of – we're I mean, thinking ahead for the next couple of years, given where the share price is and the price to book, obviously buyback super accretive. Should we assume a, quite a high mix of buybacks um, in the coming years, um, or – should I not read too much into the, the, the current sort of buyback Dibby announcement? And, this, and just to follow on that, um, is the, how much scope do you have for a sort of follow-on buyback post-stress test later in the year after the UK stress test? Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at the, uh, at the FM question, and then Andy will pick up on the, on the capital return. Uh, so the, the, the trend for our financial markets business over the past three years has been uh, a, a, a strong investment in our local market capabilities. Uh, the most, I would say, the standout performer during that period has been uh, everything around China and the RMB. Uh, we are, I'll say, A or the leading bank in terms of, of cross-border payments and associated FX flows uh, in, in China. Uh, that's been a, it's been a key driver of our, of our uh, overall CIB income, uh, that, that broad theme, uh, and it's been a key driver of our financial markets income as well. Uh, so that, that uh, step up in China is, 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 has been exceptional. Of course, we're, we're very differentiated in, uh, in South Asia and in Africa as well, which has also been an important contributor. And that's across rates uh, and uh, NFX and credit. Uh, the area we were probably furthest behind uh, historically has been on the credit side. So we, we've, we had a relatively undeveloped uh, credit origination and, uh, and credit distribution set of capabilities. And we've been building that out. I would say that we've gone from, uh, from being uh, substantially subscale in terms of, of the credit flow to being okay. Uh, now that's a good improvement. So yeah, thumbs up to the team. Uh, but we have much further that we can go. And uh, as I mentioned in my opening comments, the, the, the context uh, where global investors are getting more and more comfortable with the markets where we operate and uh, thirstier and thirstier for yield uh, should position us very well to have a, a, an ever more balanced business between uh, rates, FX, and, and, and the broad capital market slash credit dimension. Andy. Yeah, so on, on the capital returns, um, as you've seen today, we've sort of gone 50-50, not that we decided to be 50-50, um, but we are completing the pre-existing share buyback and then the rest coming back by way of dividend. Um, I think it's fair to say in our minds, and you imply this in your question or say in your question, that with the share price being by historic standards very low, then the attractions of buyback are pretty strong. Um, and therefore, sort of the lower the share price, the more, I guess, um, our minds will be focused upon uh, having buybacks in as a reasonably significant part of the overall returns profile going forwards. Um, the dividend set at the level it's at at the moment, we know most people would like a degree of predictability about dividends going forwards. It sets it at a, a sort of modest base, uh, which we should be able to increase over time. So I think you'll see some of both as we go forwards. Um, but particularly with an eye to buy back whilst the price of the shares is low. Um, post the stress test, let, let's wait and see where we get to. What we have said very clearly today is that we do not intend to be sitting above the 13 to 14% range unnecessarily. Um, if we have got profitable ways to deploy excess capital, we will go after profitable ways to, uh, to use it. Uh, to the extent we haven't, then we are very comfortable being within that 13 to 14% range, obviously subject to regulatory approval, um, but over a period of time, uh, we do understand that getting the rate up, as I said earlier, it is important we get the equity down, and therefore we will not, and I, I, I think our track record over the last two or three years has been witness to this, we are not shy of returning capital where we can sensibly afford to do so. Thanks, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from the line from Nick Lord from Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I just want to question uh, Bill a little bit more on, on what he was saying on the mass affluence strategy. Um, just could you give us a little bit more on sort of what markets you're thinking of, geographic markets in terms of attacking, um, what sort of products you'd be using? Um, and how important are those um, sort of partnerships um, for this, this expansion? And, you know, are you mainly thinking of branding it through partnerships? Are you using MOX a bit more in the branding? Or, or is it traditional standard charter branding? And, and then just finally on that, if you could maybe talk about what sort of income levels you're thinking of targeting. Are you thinking of moving right down the income scale, or are you going to stay sort of 
mid uh, in that. Great. Uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, the, uh, the the markets that we'll focus on are will, will be our, our core markets. So uh, obviously, Max is, is targeted at Hong Kong. Uh, interestingly, in Hong Kong, well, it's, it's our biggest business, it's profitable, et cetera. Uh, we only have uh, about a 2% market share in the mass market, uh, whereas we have a, a double-digit market share in, in, the, in the affluent market. Uh, we're extremely happy with our affluent market position. We'll continue to invest and grow in that. Uh, but Mox was, was, is targeting uh, both the younger population, uh, where we were also underweight, and, uh, and that mass market. And uh, I must say the reception has been extremely positive, uh, uh, which means that we should be able to, to establish a, a very important toehold uh, in that mass market segment in, in Hong Kong, in addition to what we had in, uh, and have in Standard Chartered Bank itself. And that's valuable for two reasons. One is we think it'll be profitable on its own right. Uh, and second, of course, it's a feeder into the, uh, the, 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 the today's uh, millennial mass market uh, participants will be tomorrow's affluent uh, as they accumulate savings over time. So we're, we're building our pipeline for the future uh, within MOX and but then also back into Standard Chartered Bank. Uh, we, uh, we would hope to uh, regulatory permissions uh, forthcoming to have a similar sort of partnership based model in Singapore over the course of this year. Uh, you, you noted you noticed that we've been uh, given a status as a significantly rooted foreign bank. Uh, and with that comes an entitlement to a, a second bank license. Uh, so I, I would hope that we could uh, we could get to the point where we've got a, a digital bank in Singapore uh, that's modeled much on the on the Mox basis and. and in Mox, we're, we're partnered with uh, with Hong Kong Tel, uh, FWD, and and, and Trip.com. Uh, perhaps a similar structure makes sense in Singapore as well. Uh, in in Africa, we've gone under our uh, under our own bat. Uh, so we're using existing standard chartered infrastructure that was that was structured to be completely digital end to end. Uh, so the, the partnerships are, are more tactical. So very important partnerships with telcos. We've got some really interesting arrangements with with uh, with Airtel, Orange, and Vodafone uh, in different markets. The, the three big mobile carriers, uh, but uh, continue to, to build that that partnership model. Uh, Nexus in, in Indonesia is, is obviously we, we had a we had a mass market stake in Indonesia through Permata. Uh, when we sold that, we were left with quite a small mass market business. In fact, quite a small retail business in Indonesia. Uh, the opportunity to get to uh, get access to 100 million customers uh, in partnership with Bukalapak and then with other social media platforms. Uh, is very exciting. So uh, in, in those in those markets, the, the, the partnership dimension, uh, where, we, where we're using the, the, the partner as, as, a, as a fundamental uh, distributor for our products is extremely important. Uh, so I think we're, we, we can we will cover the uh, we'll cover the, the the spectrum in terms of, of the structure of our of our entry into the mass market. Products obviously starts with uh, with deposit and uh, and payment products, and uh, we'll quickly move into credit products. In each case, and, and clearly, that's where that's where a lot of the opportunity for for growth and returns come from. It must be done safely. Uh, so we've done an extensive, extensive amount of, of experimenting and learning in terms of using our uh, our, our data, both from our own sources, uh, but also from third-party sources. So obviously, uh, offering credit product in Indonesia through the Bukalapak platform with the Bukalapak data, uh, e-commerce data is extremely powerful. Uh, but it's also relatively new. Uh, so we'll be Cautious in terms of how we roll that out, uh, but we think that the opportunity is, is very substantial. And uh, in terms of, of target range, the, the, the natural place for us to be will, will be at the top and the middle uh, elements of the uh, of the mass of the mass market. Uh, this isn't by construct <coughs> a financial inclusion play, although I will say that once we've got the, the digital operations up and running, you know, entirely mobile phone based and, and very very accessible. Uh, and, and then, especially as we get into the, the, the distribution through mass market uh, distribution platforms like Bukalapak or others in other markets, the opportunity to, to get closer or into financial inclusion will be there. But we'll do that uh, in, a, in a very prudent way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line from Tom Reiner from Numis. Your line is open. Ooh. Yes, sir. Good, good morning. Um, two questions uh, from please. Firstly, um, on the sort of shape of revenue um, as we go through 2021, <clears throat> you're indicating obviously flattish on a constant currency basis for the full year, but down in the first half and, and recovering in the second half. I wonder if you could give us an idea of what the annualised pace of revenue growth you're expecting by the end of 2021, please. 
Uh, my second question is on the ROT guidance of uh, at least 7% by 2023. I mean, obviously, you will have done some fairly detailed modelling of alternative outcomes here. I wonder if you could give us an indication on at the sort of 7%, the bottom end of the ROT range, if you like, where you're pitching revenue within the 5 to 7% uh, impairments within the 35 to 40 and and where you're sort of modelling the equity tier one ratio to be within your 13 to 14 range. So we just get a bit of an idea about, um, you know, sort of what is, is built into that 7% uh, assumption. Thank you. Yep. OK, Tom. So let, let me take those in order. So shape of revenue, and I think the important thing, which I'm sure most of you appreciate, is that we've sort of got two things going on in 2021. One is the underlying asset growth has been strong. Uh, loans and advances are up 5% last year. And if anything, you know, economy is picking up, that should be at least at that run rate going into this year. So that side of it, I think, should be running uh, pretty strong. What we are working against, however, is the interest rate impact upon the NIM. So the chart that I showed on interest rates, um, I think the first quarter, particularly last year, uh, we had the NIM at 152. And if we're talking about a number that's a shade below 124 uh, this time around, then you can sort of work the numbers out. Um, the second quarter becomes more normalized. We were 128 last year. There's, there's a little bit to give there. And then the second half of the year should be fairly close um, on the NIM from last year. So I think to, to help your sort of modeling, if you look at the volume growth that's more progressive and you just actually phase that NIM change in, you get fairly close to the numbers that uh, we were talking about. And obviously, as we have highlighted, um, the guidance was on a constant currency basis, but if you applied more up-to-date currency, uh, you would put about 0.4 on the income and 0.4 on the cost. Um, in terms of what is implied in getting to the 7% rate in 2023, um, I'm sure that uh, you will be modelling this and there will be various iter iterations around the theme. But I think if you take something around the midpoint of the 5 to 7 percent um, income range, if you work on the basis that the expenses will be 10 in 2021 and a little bit of inflation in the couple of years thereafter, that we would see the credit impairment moderating towards that 35, 40 percent but obviously there will be a period before it can get to that, dot, 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 dot. Um, you, you get to, um, sorry, I should add also an assumption that the CT1 is in the range, at the middle of range maybe, rather than sitting uh, at or above the top of the range, then you get pretty much to a 7% number. Um, and you will work out that, you know, there's an implied returns number in there of, I don't know, two and a half, three billion or something or other. It depends on exactly how you model it over that period of time. So um, I think directionally that paints the shape of, of how that sort of 7% um, construct should work. And I, I personally think each of the component parts of that is perfectly achievable. Um, the growth is there in the markets. Um, interest rates are holding us back, but the growth is there. The cost of control, the credit impairment, well, time will tell, but the indicators at the moment look you know, pretty reasonable. And um, obviously, the capital is moved forwards. At the moment, we've got um, the, the regulators obviously are careful on that front. But I think as we move through COVID, that the uh, sort of coincidence of what we as a management team feel is prudent to what regulators are comfortable with, I, I, I think those two should, should align. OK, uh, thank you very much for that. Just a very final quick um, follow up, if I may. The the five to seven is, I notice, is a, is a CAGR, but I mean, I take it that does imply that your modelling for 22 will be a, a minimum of five. It's not like it, um, you might be expecting yeah, much stronger revenue further out to, to get you there. Yeah, I, I, I think that is a fair assumption. I think to be getting to it as, a, as an average, that we are going to be have to hitting it as quickly as we can do. We prefer to be hitting it in the nearer term, but uh, realistically, for the reasons I've gone into, that will be more challenging. But yes, I think that's a reasonable assumption. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line from Manus Costello from Autonomous. Your line is open. Uh, morning, everyone. Um, 
just following up on the seven percent point, an investor pointed out to me this morning that your seven percent roti target is the same as that set by Commerzbank earlier this month. But I think most people would agree that Commerz faces a tougher domestic outlook than you should in your local markets. So the question that arises from that is at a fundamental level, what is it that's constraining your returns relative to peers, do you think? who are also dealing with the low rate environment that you talk about. Um, and if you haven't been able to drive it beyond this 7% level in an acceptable time frame, why have you decided against taking any bolder steps to, to improve that roti more quickly? Thank you. That, that is, thanks for the question, Manu. So that is a sort of the big question. And uh, I think we're going to answer it in a few parts. And I know Andy will have a on this as well. Yeah, but when, when, we, when we got a similar question uh, three years back, uh, the, uh, in particular around bold steps, the suggestion was that, that we abandon markets. And uh, you know, you, you, you've, you've talked about uh, India, Indonesia, Korea, UAE being big drags on your returns. You know, why are you still there uh, if, uh, if this is such a big, uh, big drag? Uh, we resisted the temptation to, uh, to exit, in fact, have done the opposite, which is to focus very much on how we can improve those markets. And, uh, we had a dramatic improvement last year, and we had a further dramatic improvement this year, right? 34% increase in operating profits after provisions, right? And these are mar markets that had had a rough had a rough run this year, uh, with, as Andy mentioned, uh, you know, substantial income growth in, in India. We could throw China in there as well, which had a stellar year in 2020. So these markets that, that have been have been big drags on our ROTE have uh, are actually now into solidly into, into the profit zone and are growing very very nicely. Um, so that's that, that's uh, that, that's the, hence the resistance of the of the temptation just to start hacking the strategy to pieces uh, in order to hit financial targets that that we think are much better achieved and achievable uh, through a different route. The uh, uh, maybe taking the question uh, from the from the other side, the uh, we know that we have a uh, a returns model that's very leveraged. Right? We've, we've got a, a relatively high expense base that's measured by our cost income ratio uh, relative to peers and and outright. Uh, and we know that the way to get substantially improved returns is to have our income growing faster than our expenses. Uh, we were unable to do that in 2020 for obvious reasons and reasons that we've explained. Uh, we don't think we'll make tremendous progress in 2021 for the same reasons, uh, but we think we're starting in, in 2022, we get back to that substantially positive jaws uh, that has characterized, as Andy pointed out in his slides, that, that has characterized our business uh, over, over the last several quarters pre-pandemic. Uh, and, and if you believe that we can deliver on the, the income agenda, and you believe that we can deliver on the expense agenda, uh, then that 10% comes, comes firmly into line. Uh, I think uh, mathematically, 7% uh, is someplace between 3 and 10. Uh, so you, you can pick which, which point along the way you want to say you're going to cross 7%, but, but we will cross it. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I'm obviously not going to comment on Commerce Bank. I have no idea what, uh, what, what their uh, strategy or plan is relative to ours, uh, but I do know for us, uh, we've evidenced over the past several years that we can generate this growth. Uh, we've evidenced that we can do it in a, in a controlled way, both in terms of expenses and capital. Uh, we demonstrated that we can turn around big markets uh, and, and do that in a, in, a, uh, in a fundamental and sustainable way. Uh, and we've repositioned the bank fundamentally uh, around the, these strategic pillars, including a, a, having a strong digital operation uh, and, and repositioning our, uh, our capabilities in the growth markets. So, um, it, it, it was the big question, it is the big question, and I suspect it will remain the big question for some time, but I think the, the, the evidence that we can deliver is, uh, it, it will become irrefutable over time. Andy? No, I, mean, I, I would only add to that that, you know, if you look back, 2015, we were minus a half percent for roti, um, we were six and a half percent a year ago, we've gone up seven percentage points in four years, we were on a good trend, the strategy was paying off. Um, if you take what happened to us in 2020, you look at the impact of the NIM on the interest line, you look at the uh, credit impairments relative to what they might otherwise have been, I don't think it's too difficult to get to the thick end of a four percentage point divot that we have taken on the roti in that year as a consequence of COVID. Now, some of that is credit impairment, which I do hope will unwind itself, and therefore that will give us the benefit. The interest rates, I think, is, is the wild card. Um, the, the forecast we have given you has a very modest assumption of interest rates um, over a period of time. Um, if we were to see more of a pickup over that period, and three years out is obviously quite a long time, 
then to the point that Bill has made sort of leverage on our um, operating cost base, it, it will come through very quickly from top line to bottom line. Um, so I do think we are doing the right things. I do think the markets that were uh, a drag for us, Korea particularly, you know, Korea lost $200 million five years ago. It's now making $300 million. Um, India quadrupling of profits. You know, the area where we have put focus upon there really has been improvement. I think we just need to give, as frustrating as it is, a little bit of time to work through <clears throat> the after effects of COVID. But I think many of the things within business are working well. And I would hope that in a year's time, we're sitting here, you know, with a pretty confidence of a set of numbers and saying, you know, we are now looking at pure growth ahead of us, not an interest held back rate of growth. Okay, thank you very much. So just to follow up on a comment you made there, Andy, you said you are assuming rate rises through the period. Could you give us the detail of what you're looking at there, please? Yeah, I think in the, um, I can't remember where it's actually on the chart or not, but there's, there's about 30 basis points over a three, four year period that's factored in. It's, it's, it's on the very, very modest end of the range. Got it. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. The next question comes from the line from Guy Stebbings from Exain BNP Paribas. Your line is open. Uh, morning, afternoon, everyone. Thanks for taking the questions. Um, the, the first one was on RWA. Um, I saw the, the 15 billion increase from asset quality duration in 2021. I'm just wondering whether you think that's kind of the bulk of the negative credit migration, or whether you expect to see a you know a smaller component still coming through again in 2022. And as we look further ahead, um, I presume we should be thinking about sort of low single digit per annum growth just coming from the loan book growth. Um, perhaps, you know, a tiny bit of neg negative credit migration. You've talked to circa 5% Basel headwinds, plus there's the currency headwind as things stand. Just wondering if that sort of points to uh, an RWA base by the end of 2023, 2023, sorry, somewhat north of 310 billion. Just wondering if that sort of sounds reasonable or is there more optimization you can do or maybe a reversal in the negative credit migration by that point in time to bring it back down nearer to consensus, which I think is just a, a shade over 300 billion. Um, and then just a quick um, question on restructuring charges. I think you've phrased that half a billion may need to be taken in 2021. I'm just wondering how many years to spread that over. Is that sort of three, 400 in 2021? And then it drops down to 100, 200, and, and maybe that's a sort of sensible run rate thereafter. Any sort of guidance there would be very useful. Thank you. Yeah, so let, let me let me take those. Um, the RWAs, the 15 billion we saw in 2020, uh, logic would say that is a pretty high tide mark. Um, it was the year when a lot of things changed very dramatically. And I would think on an underlying basis that whilst we'll see some adverse movement, I think it would be much lower than that um, in 2021. What we will also be doing is focusing clearly upon the mix of the uh, assets that we have got and in the knowledge that the ones that are higher rated obviously are going to be in the lower returns we will be working very actively uh, the lower returning risk weighted asset uh, relationships during the course of the year um, it's it's difficult to sort of just i mean it's simple to say yes to your question will it be low single digit but it does depend upon what natural growth there is out there and if there is profitable growth on the asset side, I would hate to have the RWAs constraining it. So I think probably the better way to look at it is probably that we would aim to try to keep the rate of growth in the RWAs down uh, below the rate of asset growth. Um, and then that will enable some flexing according to how much uh, um, activity is out there. Um, so whether that gets you to 310 or something of that order, it depends a little bit upon your growth assumptions. Um, on the restructuring, I think of that as sort of a three-year period, something of that sort of ilk, with um, probably um, awaiting more towards the first year. Um, we do want to press on with a number of the property-related sort of initiatives because obviously the time is right now uh, before everybody returns back uh, that we establish sort of new ways of working as being the norm going forwards. Um, there'll be some redundancy costs, but then we've had some redundancy costs for a period of time. And as we reskill the business, whilst we will try to redeploy as much as we can do, um, inevitably there will be some that is not achievable through redeployment per se. Uh, but I, I would think of it as sort of being three years or thereabouts with a front end loading. Thank you. Thank you. 
The next question comes from the line from Aman Raka from Barclays. Your line is open. Um, good morning, good afternoon, um, Bill and Andy. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, could I just come back to the income guidance for 2021 um, and more, more so about non-interest income? Um, just interested in to what extent you think, you know, what's your assumption around financial markets revenue in 2021? Do you see that being down year on year? Um, kind of what are the assumptions that have gone into that? You know, to what extent have you benefited from a buoyant market backdrop versus, you know, the market share gains that you, you think that business can deliver? Secondly, would be around wealth management. So I, I note that you say that um, the wealth X bank assurance, I think, was up 14%. I think it implies the rest of wealth management was actually down a decent chunk in 2020, uh, presumably as a result of the, the lockdowns and the, the lack of face-to-face -face, uh, interaction in your key market. So could, could I ask you if you were to estimate how much kind of lost revenue wealth management incurred, you know, how much revenue did you miss out on in 2020 from, from, from lockdowns and lack of face-to-face? just trying to think of, you know, what you might hope to, to reclaim as things open up this year. Uh, and I guess the final one was on your um, excess liquidity positions. I know, you know, your ADR is, is very, very low at 61. I think your loan to deposit ratio is 64. Presumably, you've got a lot of high quality, low yielding assets. Um, is there a temptation or is there an opportunity for you guys to kind of invest that, deploy that and benefit from some of the steepening of the yield curve that you've seen in some of the US, US markets. Is there any reason why you wouldn't do that? And is any of that kind of captured in your, your income guidance? Thank you. OK, um, let, me, let me try to pick those up. So financial markets clearly did have a good year last year. Um, we are sincerely hoping, and we're targeting the team, that they will replicate that performance overall again this year. Uh, the exact shape of it may change a bit. The events that lead up to it may change a bit, but we do believe there will still be volatility there. We do believe, as Bill has said, that the engine is running more strongly now and that actually the sort of product range that we have got, the capability we've got there, um, is as good as we have had that, certainly um, in the last several years. So uh, we, we would very much be hoping that uh, financial markets income overall will be up uh, with what happened in 2020. Um, wealth management, I mean, you can you can sort of cut it in different directions. We found the second quarter very tough, and as you say, face-to-face um, -face contact was very difficult during that period of time. What I think has happened since then, two or three things. One, uh, confidence has, has come back, particularly the equity markets rising, and therefore clients being more prepared to get back into uh, wealth products. Um, secondly, we have availed ourselves far more of uh, non-face-to-face -face contact and we have improved the digital capabilities, and I think people are progressively getting more used to that and are actually more comfortable with that. Um, as I said earlier, um, I think the overall wealth management was down probably about 15% or so in the second quarter, but by the fourth quarter, actually, we were up 5% on the fourth quarter a year ago. So I do think the trend there um, is looking good. And in January, certainly, um, on both actually financial markets and wealth management, we, we, had, um, we had a strong performance. Um, on the excess liquidity, um, the story last year really, and I'm, I'm sure we were not the only ones to say this, was there was a lot of liquidity out there. Um, we managed to improve the mix of the liabilities that we have got quite significantly during the year. We have deployed some of those commercially, but some of those are sitting with the Treasury book, and those are fully capable of being deployed. So um, the encouragement to the commercial teams actually to, uh, to find opportunities out there uh, obviously, we make more money when we are lending it commercially than having it sitting in the centre. Um, and therefore, I think the sort of shape of the balance sheet within the overall numbers um, will be interesting to watch as we go through the course of this year. Just a quick follow-up on that then. Do, do, you, um, do you have any exposure to the kind of five, ten-year part of the US curve where you've seen the steepening in recent weeks? Is that is that something we should think about being a positive or is it not? Um, it, it is a small part of the portfolio, and obviously we are monitoring it very closely as we go through, and um, that, that may give us a little bit of upside as we move forwards. I, just, I, I guess not the obvious, we, we monetized 
quite a bit of the game last year. Uh, so that that's that that's that's evident. Uh, there was still some game left in the portfolio, and some of that was was duration, uh, but much much lighter than it was a year ago. Okay, thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line from Fired Kudwa from Redburn. Your line is open. Hi, uh, morning, afternoon, um, everyone. Thanks for taking my questions. Just a couple. Um, just one was on the um, the confidence of NIM um, stability for the kind of Q4 levels. I know we're talking about the, the shape of it being a bit different, but um, one of your peers was talking about commercial asset repricing. Um, are, are you seeing anything similar into the repricing activity in the commercial book uh, in uh, the kind of Asia Pacific region? Um, and my second question um, was just um, kind of back on that seven percent ROT versus peers. I guess one of the things that's confusing is you've got a you know a very low loan to deposit ratio, but a very high funding cost versus peers. Um, and there was an optimization program which it feels like it's run its course. Is there not more you can do on the liquidity management side to to drive returns higher? Um, I would have thought as rates fell, that higher funding cost would have been an advantage. But in the end, I guess that didn't really help too much. And, and the reason I ask the question is one of the things that gets pushed back a lot really is that it's evidence that you've got too thin a franchise across too many countries. So how are you thinking about um, that liquidity management and that high funding cost? Uh, thank you. Maybe on the uh, corporate repricing, uh, I think the short answer is no. Uh, we're not seeing the wholesale repricing. I thought we, we saw a very uh, sort of consistent margin compression going into the pandemic. Uh, we saw a, a, a certainly a, a, uh, a bit of an improvement in liability margins as we as we got into the into the pandemic period. And uh, coming out uh, at the very high quality end of the of the spectrum, we're seeing repricing, but that's not the, that's not the bulk of our book. Uh, we should be able to offset the, the underlying margin compression in the, in the corporate book through an ongoing uh, mixed shift. So uh, clearly we're in a position to distribute much more of the, of the lower margin or higher, uh, higher quality uh, credit risk in our portfolio. Uh, and our balance sheet uh, will be focused on things where we can add some real value. Uh, we should have a little bit of, of incremental return. So we don't see a, a, a structural challenge coming from ongoing uh, corporate repricing when we, when we Look at uh, volume times margin. Yeah, and on the the, the seven percent sort of number, I guess for part of last year we were very happy to gather uh, liabilities just because of the unpredictability of what was happening out in the market. Um, as we got to the back end of the year, clearly we have built up uh, a more uh, quality liabilities, and the mix change in that has improved a lot. And therefore, the focus is now much more upon how we monetize that by way of lending on the commercial side. So that will be the focus. Uh, there is growth out in the markets. You saw loans and advances were up 5% last year for us. So there is no lack of uh, volume uh, appetite out there. And uh, indeed, with many of the markets which are operating, they're clearly coming through COVID earlier than some other markets in the world. So I hope we will be able to... Uh, shift some of that from uh, uh, the lower returning part of the balance sheet to higher returning, and that will be part of the income story for the year and, and indeed thereafter. Oh, so just clarify, that's included, though, in the 7% ROT after 2023? Yes, it is. Yes, it is, absolutely. Um, there are many component parts, but yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line from Ed Firth from KBW. Your line is open. Yeah, morning, everybody. Um, can, I, can I just bring you back to a sort of slightly broader question, not, not so much you know, this year, but more out to sort of 2023 and beyond? Because when I look at your you know, key dynamics at the moment, I mean, your capital ratios are towards the low end of peers. Your growth prospects, your signaling are, are really high end of peers, probably off the top end of the high end of peers. Um, and yet your profitability is at the low end. And, and yet we're trying to square all that at the same time as talking about buybacks. And, and I, I really don't understand why this obsession with buying back shares when you, if you really believe you can deliver five to 7% growth, and I accept, you know, we can play around with the risk weighted assets and stuff. But if we are coming out of a pandemic and there's massive growth opportunities and you're right in the center of it, 
why would you risk missing that in order to buy back, you know, 250 million of shares or whatever? Good. Well, Ed, th th thanks for the question. Uh, I think, uh, first of all, I, I, our capital is not at the low end. I think if you look at our capital relative to our regulatory minima, we are uh, sort of middle of the pack, uh, very well capitalized. We certainly think we're very well capitalized. And when we look at the, uh, at certainly the, the stress tests that were done pre-pandemic, uh, our peak to trough drawdown is, is, is extremely manageable relative to uh, either outright or relative to peers. So, uh, so we're not we're not low capital. Uh, second, uh, yeah, our profitability is low. I think we talked a fair amount uh, about the, uh, the about the reasons for that uh, being our, our relatively leveraged business model with, with the significant uh, challenge that we had in, in income and obviously loan impairments uh, or loan provisioning uh, during 2020. Uh, we think we can grow our way out of that, uh, and as we have in, in the past, and uh, but we are we are we are resetting from a lower level. Uh, we're not obsessed with buybacks. Maybe some people are. Uh, we're not. Uh, we, we have uh, excess capital right now. Uh, we've got a very, uh, we have maintained a very healthy investment program up to, through and including the fourth quarter of 2020. Uh, we did that because we do believe in our business. Uh, but we believe that the investments that we are, that the investment program that we're executing right now is, is the appropriately sized program for both what we can absorb, also what we, what we need to do and what we, what we want to do. Uh, we've always said that if we have investment opportunities that uh, that are uh, that, that present themselves uh, that would require an increase uh, and, and they're truly attractive, then we'll do that. And that would come at the expense of buybacks or other distributions. Uh, we've equally said that, that, that once we've uh, satisfied the, the need to fund the, the growth in our business, that the surplus will return to shareholders. And we're absolutely committed to that. We demonstrated that and we reaffirmed that. Uh, both in action in terms of our proposals for uh, for the uh, the final dividend in 2020, and in terms of our statements that you've heard both from me and Andy, uh, so uh, that's the, 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 there's nothing that's really changed uh, in that regard. But I, I think overall, yeah, we're we're very comfortable with our capital position. We're 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 comfortable. We've got a good plan to deal with our profit challenges. Well, I guess you also mentioned that that we've got uh, growth that's ahead of peers. Plus, because we're in, in, in much more attractive markets than than I think the people that you are thinking about when you talk about peers. Obviously, if you, if you look at the, the, the our peers in our markets, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, uh, then uh, the, the growth forecasts that we're showing are probably consistent with what you're seeing from others in those in those markets, uh, and and we think that that, that, that that we have what it takes to deliver that kind of growth rate. It, it just seems to me that if you're going to deliver, you know, five to seven percent growth in a sustainable manner, it, it, it's it's absolutely imperative to you. It's not like an option to get to ten percent. If you can't, then you, you're not going to be able to generate enough capital to support it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And you know, as Andy pointed out a couple of times, thankfully, up until the, the point of the pandemic, we were growing at five to seven percent. Uh, and that's having come off of a pretty, pretty uh, fundamental transformation uh, where, where sometimes it's a little bit harder to grow mm. when you come to the repositioning that we went through. Uh, that transformation is, is, is very well embedded at this point. You know, the investments that we've been making in productivity, the investments in, uh, in, in digital tools, and digital capabilities are very well established at this point. So. We feel more comfortable, comfortable about our ability to to, to hit uh, sort of market norms in terms of, of growth uh, than we have at any time in the past. Now, you'd have to have some sort of of, of macroeconomic uh, support. I you know, hopefully we can avoid we can get out of this pandemic and, and not go into the next one. Uh, hopefully we can avoid the kind of geopolitical tensions that we were afraid of last year. It looked like it might derail our uh, our business growth. And as it turns out, it didn't, uh, but it might have. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll need. An avoidance of headwinds, if we can put it that way. We don't actually need a big tailwind relative to what we've got right now. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. The next question comes from the line from Joseph Dickerson from Jefferies. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Thank you for taking my question. Most has been uh, addressed already, but I guess if you're looking for growth in the financial markets, and it sounds like uh, possibly growth in uh, wealth management, particularly if bank assurance can can pick up. And if I'm not mistaken, a large factor there is the border between Hong Kong and uh, China being closed, presumably. Um, I guess, are you more cautious on the transaction banking outlook to, to, to get you back to the flat uh, revenue growth, given that the, the NII looks like, uh, based on your guidance uh, for the full year, that we can get you to kind of flat $6.9 billion uh, without assuming any uh, higher margin on the incremental growth. So that's, that's I guess, the first question. And then 
um, the 13 to 14 percent range on targeted common equity tier one versus your base uh, requirement at 10 percent. I guess why couldn't that be you know, 100 basis points lower, particularly given you're sitting here with a 31 percent uh, MREL, you know, and, and it sounds like you've got a bit more visibility on where, you know, Basel III lands. Are we waiting for the Basel III refinements or is this going to be a, a, a longer run target or or do you kind of need that uh, level to, uh, to to prior question to absorb uh, the growth you're putting through while the R ROE is still uh, subpar? Thanks. Maybe I just offer a quick comment on, on the growth question, and, and then you will have more on the growth as well as the uh, the, the capital. Uh, the uh, if we look back through the years, the, uh, the wealth management product line has, has been able to deliver growth in the high single digits or double digits level. It's been quite volatile around that, uh, including uh, for the reason that you mentioned, bank insurance uh, took a big step back, really for two reasons. One is that the Hong Kong China physical border being being closed, and, and second, the, the need even within Hong Kong or within uh, Singapore or Taiwan uh, for medical checks. And people were, for all the obvious reasons, were reluctant to get medical checks uh, during the during the COVID period. Uh, that's beginning to return, so we're seeing some pickup in, in bank insurance activity. The Hong Kong-China border remains closed, uh, although uh, we haven't talked much about the Greater Bay Area and the opportunities there, but the, the opportunities that are presented uh, to us to take our strong position in Guangdong province, Shenzhen uh, in particular, and our strong position in Hong Kong, uh, and to capitalize on what, what seems to be a, a pretty well-established trend now in China, of opening up the, the, the capital account, opening up the, the border for, for cross-border investments, uh, and then eventually, obviously, opening up the border for, for physical travel, uh, is extremely encouraging, uh, and, and particularly encouraging for our wealth business, where we just are in, in an excellent position on, on both sides of the border. Uh, especially as Chinese savers are able to perfectly legitimately uh, invest more in international assets or international funds, uh, which is which is our sweet spot. And frankly, we've been preparing for this for the better part of six, seven years in terms of, of having a very strong brand in China for international uh, investment product, which has largely been, been unsatisfied for, for the reasons of, of the currency controls that are in place. To the extent that those loosen up over the coming years, that, that's a, an underlying uh, very strong uh, source of growth. Uh, the financial markets, I wasn't sure I, I, I got, got what, your, what your question was really, but, the, uh, but maybe Andy maybe you can take a stab at that. But the, 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 certainly we, we have opportunities to, to structurally grow our, our FM business, but it's, it's going to be volatile from, from quarter to quarter uh, with an element of seasonality as well. Andy? Yeah, I, I think uh, you, you were circling around if, if financial markets wealth management looks strong, but the overall is going to be sort of flat, then does that imply transaction banking, et cetera, are going to be lower? Um, I think the reality is That's probably right. yeah. um, because not least, uh, as I said earlier, in Q1, we have this huge NIM normalization still going on. And uh, particularly in the first quarter, going from low 150s to low 120s is a near 20% reduction. And therefore, the interest rate sensitive products will be the ones that have yet to come some way down the curve. Um, when we're through that, and particularly by the half year, then hopefully we are more normalized on year on year comparisons. But th that is the reason for that. Um, on, on your question on the, the sort of capital levels, it's, it's sort of an interesting one. Um, 13 to 14 percent is a range we've had for a period of time. We're obviously at the top end of it at the moment. Um, if you compare us with UK banks, which isn't necessarily the best point of comparison, but if you do, we are around four percentage points above the declared regulatory minimum. That is very much in the pack. Um, most of the other UK banks are in that sort of range, so it's not abnormal. Um, the reason that everybody does sit that much above it is because there's a variety of factors go into a decision as to where one should target to be on the capital front. Some of it is what the regulators are requiring. Some of it is what rating agencies are requiring. Some of it is what we feel comfortable with uh, stress tests and so on, taking the external environment into account that we are comfortable with. And I think at this point in time, clearly COVID has um, worked its way through in a, a sort of substantial way, but not yes, yet a complete way. Um, we've said that being back in the 13 to 14 range is where we want to be rather than sitting above it. Um, so I think that gives you a pretty strong indication. Um, we are very mindful of the fact that the more we can work to the lower end of that range or even below it, it would be great for the roti. Uh, and that point is not lost upon us. 
Um, so so that, that's sort of how we look at it, but um, the 13 to 40 range at the moment, and um, at some point in time, if we get to the lower end of that range, that would be great. Bill, moving on to questions on the webcast then. Um, there are actually questions on similar sustainability themes. So let me try and condense them into one. Uh, the climate crisis is devastating hundreds of communities around the world. So what steps are you taking on climate change generally, and in particular in relation to financing fossil fuel activities? Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge question, and uh, one that I'm very happy and very, very proud of our answer. Uh, we, uh, we, we have been clear that we, will, uh, that we are on a transition path to get to net zero by 2050. Uh, the, the work that we've done in terms of our scope one and two and, and our, our controllable scope three missions, so for example, flights, uh, is, has already had substantial improvements, so even independent of the COVID effect. Uh, we've, made, we've made tremendous progress, and uh, we will uh, uh, almost certainly be acquiring uh, carbon offsets to, to get to net zero for our scope one, two, and, and controllable scope three missions in the, in the not too distant future. The, uh, the, the big one is, is financed emissions, and that, that really gets to, to the point of, uh, of, of the question, which is uh, climate change is, is in some cases already devastating uh, the communities in which we operate, and certainly will devastate the, the planet if we don't get this right uh, over the next uh, 20 to 30 years. And we need to, we need to begin now and make real progress by 2030 uh, to have any hope of, of getting to an, an acceptable outcome by 2050. Uh, so as, as I mentioned earlier, we've, we've got a... Uh, we have been on the path to, to net zero, and we've been on the, the, the path to complete alignment with Paris for several years now. It uh, started with our uh, cessation of all financing of, of coal-fired uh, power plants or, or the, the coal industry itself. Uh, it goes on to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the very clear statements we made and, and the discussions we're having with our clients that they will need to basically straight line reduce their dependence on coal uh, between now and, uh, and 2030. Uh, in order to continue banking with us. Uh, you know, there was some question when we when we began that process, whether there'd be a big income hit. You know, we can end up exiting a lot of clients who just you know, are unwilling or unable to, to accommodate. And I think the possibility that some of our clients will be unwilling or unable, of course, is there. But the vast majority of our clients have responded by saying, yeah, we know we have to reduce our dependence on coal, and we know we're going to have to reduce our dependence completely over time. And we know that fossil fuels will be the next, other fossil fuels will be the next to come. Uh, can you work with us on, on developing our, uh, our alternative uh, either business models or manufacturing processes or sources of power uh, that will allow us to meet the, uh, our own uh, net zero transition plans? Uh, and that's, uh, there's, there's a challenge in there. There's also a great opportunity because every, every one of those uh, transitions for every one of our clients is, is a financing opportunity uh, in an area where we have a real competitive advantage uh, globally, I would say, but in particular in emerging markets. So, uh, we share the objective of, of the questioner, questioners, uh, to get to a, a net zero uh, planet by 2050. Uh, we're absolutely committed to that. Uh, we're committed to uh, delivering a, a very detailed roadmap for how we're going to get there uh, between now and 2050 with clear milestones along the way. Uh, we will be sharing that over the course of this year and the later part of the year. Uh, and, and we're talking now with our shareholders about how we could put that plan do a shareholder advisory vote at the 2022 AGM uh, so that we, we can both hold ourselves uh, but also uh, hold our owners uh, to account for holding us to account uh, to deliver on our commitments. Thank you, Bill. So uh, if there are no more questions, yep. no more questions, that, that thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us in uh, First thing in the, in the morning on a Thursday in uh, in London, uh, Andy and I sitting in the boardroom of, of Warren's Basin Avenue. Happy to be back. Uh, looking forward to being back here a little bit more regularly with our colleagues and looking forward to having a chance to meet with all of you uh, face to face in the time to come. Uh, please uh, stay safe and healthy. Bye.